Please rise as you are able for the singing of our doxology. church. Good morning. It is great to see you this morning. I am not Pastor Unheche. I am Pastor Unheche's husband, Chris Walters. Unhe and Linda Duback are on the civil rights pilgrimage uh, for the past several days with Linda Duback and about 35 other people from around our conference. And I think Linda will share with you, uh, I think next month, their adventure. So it's great to be with you in worship today. I want to invite you to bow, or perhaps if you get permission, you may shake a hand or give a hug if you would like to do that. I feel at some point I want to give you permission to do that. So whatever manner of greeting you'd like to extend to each other and to those worshiping online, good morning. Let us join together in our opening prayer. Holy God, we come asking for more of your spirit in our lives. We come seeking a clearer understanding of your will. We come knocking for doors of opportunity to open. We come knowing that you are always more ready to give than we are to receive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing hymn number 200, 236 in our black hymnals.
seated. But don't put that book away. Turn to 2270 and please join the choir as the children come up for the children's message. everyone. So I teach high school science when I'm not here, and I have a globe like this that's sitting in my classroom, and I have a group of students who play this little game. Every time they come in, they take the globe and they spin it, and they go like this. And they say something like, that's where I'm going to live someday, or that's where my next vacation is going to be. Anybody want to spin the globe and see where your next vacation? Okay, Trevor, come on up. I thought you'd want to do this. Okay. You got to, Maggie, can you help them skin, spin the globe? Can you spin it really fast? And you're just going to put your finger someplace. Yep. Keep spinning it and put your finger someplace. Oh, the ocean. Okay. <laughs> He's going to be on a boat in the North Pacific. All right. Anybody else? You want to try it? Not today. Yeah. Okay. Let's see where you're going to live. Maggie, you spinning? Can you spin again? Okay. Where are you going to live? or your next vacation. All right, ooh, Russia, okay. <laughs> Maggie, I'll, can one of you guys spin it for Maggie? She wants to pick, come on up, Trevor. Yeah, so Trevor's gonna spin it for Maggie, and then Maggie, put your finger out, okay, that's good. Put your finger someplace. Just, oh, she's picking her spot, okay. Okay, when it slows down, you put, pick your fing put your finger on it. Let's see. <laughs> oh, she's looking for Australia. <laughs> there, she got it. All right. All right, Australia. Okay, wow, huh. Everybody come back up here. So when the early, early, early church started, anybody know where on the globe that might be? If you come really close, maybe we can find it. It's right, come close. It's right here. Jerusalem. Have you heard of that place before? Is, that, is it the little green spot? It is the little green spot. And where do we live? We live all the way over here. Yeah. So how did the information from here get all the way over here? Trevor, you have an answer for that? Yeah? Email? Well, maybe today. <laughs> but how about, you are correct, today, but how about when Jesus walked there? How did the information from here, from this place, get all the way over to this place? What do we think? Pigeons. Pigeons. That would still be a little, that's a little, they don't cross the ocean very well. Hmm. Yeah, what do you think? Take a boat. They could take, yeah, they could take a boat. That's how John Wesley came over here, right? He took a boat. Well, I want to show you another map that may, might help us out. So can anybody find Jerusalem on this map? This is when, yeah, maybe look in this area by the star. Can we find Jerusalem there? Yep, so this star, that's where Jerusalem was. And that's where some of Jesus' first disciples like Peter, James, and John, that's where they started their first church. What do you think their, that church building looked like? Do, Trevor, what do you think? A shed. A shed. Hmm, maybe. What do you, any idea, did it look like our building here? Yeah. Pro think so. You think so? Probably not, it probably didn't look, in fact, I don't know if it was a building. Hmm. If it wasn't a building, what was the first church like? Yeah? Uh, uh, an outside church. 
Maybe it was an outside church. Maybe people gathered by a rock. But it was all about people. It wasn't about the building itself. It was about people coming together and sharing good news. How do you share good news today? Email. Mm -hmm. Huh? Social media. media. Yeah. But back then, they couldn't share, they didn't have email and social media. So they went to people's homes and they gathered in different places outside and they shared the good news of Jesus. And that's how some of our churches started, right? By sharing the good news that way. So you're going to learn about some of that today in Sunday school. But first, Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for those early believers who started to share the good news of Jesus that eventually spread throughout the world. Help us to also share the good news of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. reading from the Old Testament, Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the inequity of your people. You pardoned all their sin, Salah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and we will make a path for his steps.
Please rise as you are able for a reading from the gospel. This is Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed, and I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who search finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asked for a fish, would give a snake instead of a fish? Maybe. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I invite you to please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Dear Holy God, we come to you this Sunday morning with perhaps all sorts of expectations about how our week might unfold from here, how the month of May may unfold, how the year of 2023 may unfold, Lord, we don't know. What even this afternoon will bring, let alone this week or next month or the rest of this year or the rest of our life. But we come here with the expectation that if we seek you and we knock on your door, that you will respond. So, Lord, we pray that you keep our minds open and keep our hearts open, keep our families open, 
Keep our church community open. Keep all of humanity open to your response that we seek justice, we seek mercy, and we seek peace for this world and for all eternity. Lord, we pray this in your most holy name and the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, do you have a certain place where you go to restore yourself? I want to just give you just a few moments to think of perhaps your favorite place that maybe you go today or you've gone in the past, or maybe it's some place you like to go to once a year. Maybe it's your favorite vacation spot. For me, sometimes it's just the hammock in the backyard. Think of that place that you like to go to, to recenter yourself, to connect yourself to your past, to your present, and to your future. So just close your eyes for a second and put yourself in that place, wherever it might be. Maybe there's one place that immediately comes to mind. Maybe there's two or three places that kind of flicker in your imagination, but settle on one place where you go to settle yourself down and reconnect to yourself, your life story, and perhaps even to reconnect to God. Let's just meditate on that for just a few moments. So now open your eyes and kind of keep that place in your imagination as I share with you this morning. Are you outdoors? Are you indoors? We heard some of this this morning in the children's message. How did they do church back then? Probably some outdoor church, some indoor church in people's houses. Are you close to where you are now in this sanctuary? Maybe your place is in the sanctuary. Are you alone? Or are you with others? What feelings do you associate with this place? Maybe it's solitude. Maybe it's togetherness. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe it's coziness. One of my certain places of restoration is Starved Rock State Park. And I think many of you have been there. Namely, going into the canyons right off the Illinois River. I started visiting the park with my friends in my senior year of high school. And as you probably remember, I grew up in Palatine. And I loved nature as a kid. And as a family, we visited many beautiful places. We had a, one of those old Midas campers. It was basically like a pickup truck with a box on the back. And we went all over the country, Rocky Mountain National Park and Grand Canyon and all that. We would go up to Wisconsin on occasion over the weekend. But my family never knew about Starved Rock State Park, which is right in our very own backyard. When I wanted to propose to Unhe, I knew that I wanted to take her to my certain place of reconnection, and that was Starved Rock. I had the perfect certain place in mind, which was LaSalle Canyon. See, this canyon is it's in the middle of the park, and it's formed as almost a perfect half dome at the end of the canyon, and there's a waterfall that comes over that half dome and falls just perfectly into the end of the canyon, and you can walk behind the waterfall and clap your hands and get all the fun reverb and all that stuff. If it's a hot day, you can just literally stand right under the waterfall and get cooled off. If it's the winter, it turns into a column of ice. This is where I wanted to propose to Unhe in my certain place. So as we hiked along the Illinois River Trail to get to LaSalle Canyon, I kept thinking about, okay, right there at the end of the canyon, behind the waterfall, 
That's where I'm going to propose. But as we got into the canyon, there was a problem. There were several young, boisterous guys by the waterfall acting all goofy. They were ruining my certain place. I wanted to propose one soul to another. We're both introverts, if you haven't noticed that. I wanted a one-on-one -on -one encounter with Unhe amidst a God's awesome nature, as I had imagined it in my head. I didn't want anyone else to be there. Now, some people, they plan elaborate proposals in the midst of many, even thousands of people. Just recently, maybe you saw this on the news, a guy proposed in, out in a baseball field, and he jumped out there to go down on his knee with this ring in the middle of thousands of people, and then security came out and just totally hammered the guy because they didn't know what was going on. So that was his proposal. He got totally smashed by the security. <laughs> that was not me. I just wanted it to be just the two of us. I wanted to continue the richness of a one-to-one -one relationship as best friends. When I'd gone there before, mostly it was with one other friend or maybe two other friends. So I think perhaps if I were to psychoanalyze myself, I wanted to continue that type of relationship with my wife as my best friend. So what did I do in the moment? I thought a little bit and then I realized and I got very frustrated that I would just propose right there on the trail in a not so certain place on the east side of the canyon, far enough away from the noise of those hooligans. When I hike that trail now, I, I, I can't even remember like exactly where I proposed and that's not how I wanted to remember it. That was September of 1999 and we were married in April of 2000 and we just celebrated 23 years. So we did something right. Maybe the proposal <laughs> had a rocky start, but. When we got married, I was 32 and she was 39. We both had life experience at the time, but now 23 years later, we really are best friends. One thing that I have learned and that I keep trying to learn is that while she is my best friend and I love talking to her about the stuff that I care about, she does not share the same enthusiasm that I have for certain topics. <laughs> have you ever heard that before? <laughs> I think she has stood right here or over there and she has said that and how much I can put her to sleep sometimes with my talk about theology and I see Brad, hello Brad, how are you doing? <laughs> Brad and I are brothers on this issue. <laughs> Recently in one of her sermons, she mentioned how much that I love spewing forth the politics and the theology and the science and everything, and it just puts her to sleep sometimes. Now, maybe it's because she's older than I am that that happens. Or maybe, it's because she has more wisdom than I do about how the world works. Maybe she knows better than I do that the world will just do its own thing regardless of how many words and ideas that I pour forth into the abyss of cosmic complexity and geopolitical uncertainty. Sometimes I feel like the friend in Jesus' parable in Luke 11, after he teaches his disciples how to pray. I knock and I knock and I knock at the door of my wife's heart and her mind to, amiss, to elicit some just kind of mutual concern or maybe outrage or wonder, to be sympathetic to whatever it is that I'm feeling. And she says, Similarly, in the parable, do not bother me, I am in bed. 
Now, I tell you, even though she would not get up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, she will get up and give him whatever he needs. But what do I truly need? And can she provide it? I am persistent, but what I have learned is that the thing I seek on the surface, it may just simply be a mirrored enthusiasm for my concerns. And she cannot consistently provide that. Now, she has her own deep concerns, but rather, I am seeking the daily presence, the daily bread, as we might pray in the Lord's Prayer, of that pure presence, of just being present with each other. And I think many of you know the five love languages. If you do not know the five love languages, just Google that, read the book. I highly recommend that book. You may have pegged that my primary love language is quality time, which is showing love and affection by spending dedicated time together. According to Jerry, Gary Chapman, the author of the five love languages, how to express heartfelt commitment to your mate. He says, nothing says I love you like full, undivided attention from those you love. The other four love languages are acts of service, gift giving, physical touch, and words of affirmation. The main concept of the book is that you need to learn your mate's primary love language and then communicate to them in their primary love language to so-called fill their love tank. If you do not do this, that is, if you don't communicate to your mate in their primary love language, then their love tank depletes and they might feel unloved. Now, my wife says she wants all five love languages. <laughs> but that's maybe another sermon topic for another Sunday morning. Persistent Presence preserves fervent friendship. Persistent presence preserves fervent friendship. Without quality of presence, quality of friendship is fleeting. The psalmist prayed to God, Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Reading Psalm 85, it starts out like God is our best friend. I imagine the psalmist messaging God on his phone after a breakup. I know I did a wrong thing. You say you forgive me, but I don't feel like it. Say something. Respond to my messages. Make me feel better. Meanwhile, God is knocking at the psalmist's door. I'm right here. Get off your phone and open the door. If this was a Hollywood rom-com, the lady would open the door and the guy would be standing there with a bouquet of flowers. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> they would drop their phones and then they would embrace and they would kiss each other passionately. The end. <laughs> Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Now, we can view God as our friend or even as our spouse, for we are, as the church, the bride of Christ. According to the psalmist, God's persistent presence springs up from the ground and looks down from the sky. God's presence is persistent and all-encompassing. 
We can easily miss the deeper meaning of this little parable in Luke chapter 11 and Jesus' explanation by solely thinking of the friend, the seeker, the knocker, as the human, constantly seeking God's attention to get something from God. But the persistent seeker, the persistent knocker, is also God seeking us, knocking on our door. We encounter this metaphor in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. I hope when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we feel formed by its pattern and not so much by its literal words. I hope we're formed by its persistent yearning for the certain place of God's fulfillment in our hearts, in our relationships, in all of the world. There is an ultimate certain place that we would call the resurrection of all creation. This is the kingdom come as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. The grand epic of the biblical journey from creation to conflict to completion is gloriously presented in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Death will be no more, mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Now you have heard it said many times, I'm sure, that the church is not the building. The church is the people. Now this is true, but the church as a bundle of fervent friendships preserved by God's and our own persistent presence in this certain place, where we catch a glimpse of the certain place in the resurrection of the kingdom of God, the coming of the new heaven and the new earth, that makes the church as the people God's certain place. We are God's certain place where God can come and rest with us, as did Jesus in the incarnation. So go back in your imagination to that certain place that I invited you to go there earlier. Now imagine that Jesus is asking you to bring him to that certain place. What do you want from Jesus during your time there? Do you want to talk and ask a million questions? Do you want him to give you a gift? Do you really simply want a hug from Jesus? Do you simply want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful friend? Do you want him to lead you over to the people nearby who need some help? Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus is here now. Jesus is seeking you. Jesus is seeking everyone. The kingdom is knocking on your door. May this church, Glenview United Methodist Church, be a certain place for all people to meet Jesus and each and every one of you. Amen.
At this time, we will gather ourselves together for some common prayer. And remind you that we do have prayer cards in the backs of the pews. If you would like to share any prayer concern with uh, Pastor Unhey and the church staff, they pray for those concerns regularly. Uh, we do share those concerns throughout the community. If you would like to have uh, a confidential conversation with the Stevens minister, we have Stevens ministers in this church, or you can talk to the pastor. Please take advantage of that. Let us go to God in prayer. Your God, we, we hear you knocking. Sometimes we might have the headphones of life on and your knock is just so very faint and we don't even know. Is that really you knocking on our door? Or maybe, Lord, sometimes when you're knocking, we're busy in the kitchen cleaning the dishes of our life and you're knocking and we're thinking to ourselves, I don't know who's really knocking on my door right now. I just need to take care of myself. I can handle it. I can clean up the dirty dishes of my own life. Lord, sometimes you're knocking and we look out through the little peak hole in our door as a security measure to see who's really there on the other side of the door. Should I let this person in? And we can't tell if it's you or if it's someone who's trying to get something out of us. Or maybe we think, oh, it's that neighbor or that friend of mine that I just don't feel too close to right now that just keeps pestering me about something. But yet it's you knocking. Lord, I pray that you can help us be more open to all the knockings on our life. But I pray that you help us discern when the knocking is from you. Sometimes, Lord, we just have to open the door to see who is knocking and deal with whoever is there. And if it's you that we open the door to, may we rejoice. May we be reassured that you will bring us peace and joy and restoration. And Lord, if we open the door to someone or something that is not you, Help us remember that you are our friend. You are our groom. You are in relationship with us. That no matter is what on the other side of the door, that we can handle that. Lord, we just want to take all of those anxieties that we have about all those things that are pressuring us that just seems like maybe the door just feels like it's constantly knocking and we just can't deal with any of it. Lord, we pray so much for all those people that are so incredibly deeply affected and traumatized by the violence in this country where a young person can just knock on the door by mistake and be faced with intense fear and a gun. Lord, I pray that you crash into the hearts and minds of those people that are gun owners to not be the first thing they grab 
when they feel that sense of fear and anxiety. They don't need to open the door. God, help those people to discern how to be more responsible, how to not live in fear. When you came back to the disciples, you said, have no fear. Lord, I pray that you indeed lead us as your children, as your disciples, to constantly remind ourselves that we should have no fear. Sometimes there are scary things on the other side of the door. But if we can respond, not out of a sense of fear, but out of a sense of trust that our life belongs to you, that our life is limited, that this earthly life is not all that there is, maybe we will have more confidence in facing everything on the other side of the door. So God, we just want to take a few moments in silence to lift up those of us close by here in this neighborhood or maybe friends and family that are around the country or around the world that may be struggling with health issues or maybe broken relationships, maybe an impending divorce, maybe children are having trouble in school. Lord, whatever is on our hearts and minds, we want to lift that up to you now in this moment of silence. And now, dear Lord, we want to pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil. And that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise as you are able, and we will sing hymn number 547.
please be seated. I'm going to draw your attention to the uh, community life and ministry opportunities in your bulletin. Please read that thoroughly. There's so much going on here that you can participate in, both within the church community and beyond the church community. Every fifth Sunday in our annual conference, we have a fifth Sunday appeal, and you have an envelope in there. Anything that you give to the church in this envelope will go to United Voices for Children that supports organizations that were started by Methodists like you. Sometimes it was a long time ago, but organizations like Rosecrans, uh, Kids Above All, that used to be called Child Serve, and then MYSI, which is Methodist Youth Services. These are three excellent organizations and they really appreciate your donations and your connections. I'd like to invite Kay Hartu to come forward at this moment to share with us a special announcement. Good morning. morning. On behalf of the mission team from Women in Faith, uh, we wanted to thank Becky Nedlin and Janet Cullen for the very big success we had in our rummage sale this year. Because of the help of all the church people and Wesley Daycare who came every day and helped us clean up as they always do, we are, uh, because of the sales that we made, we are giving uh, Wesley Daycare $2,000 and we are giving the church $6,000. So thank you very much for all your help. Okay. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how many people come and go out of this building because we have two schools here and so many other organizations that use this building, and you should be very proud of that. And you all, as a church community, take excellent care of this building. Um, it's just such a joy to see so many people coming with their little children, especially when the weather gets better and they're out here playing in the front yard. Uh, because I get to live on this property, it, I just can't tell you how much I enjoy seeing the life that comes and goes uh, in and out of this community. Um, you have an opportunity to serve the church, to serve not only this church community, but everything that is attached to this community through your financial donations to the church. We really appreciate so many of you are recurring givers. That's an excellent way to sustain the ministries of this church. If you'd like to give online, you can give online by going to the church website, glenviewumc.org. And we also have the plates behind the, the last pew there that you can contribute on your way out of the sanctuary. You have worshiped God. You have gathered as the certain place of God's heart, as the church. As God came in the person of Jesus, God comes in human flesh as the church to bring heaven on earth so that you can be a recreated humanity, that you can live out the full completion of God's promise to remake each and every one of you in his perfect image. Go forth in peace. Amen. Thank you. 